Hi, I'm uh, David Levine. I'm Swanee co-chair. Um, um, Gerald, do you want to come on? Okay. Hi, and my, gu my guest tonight is Gerald Posner. Um, producing this show is Joseph Fonner. Um, Gerald, this is there your second time with us, and I'll give a brief introduction. Um, Gerald is the author of 13 acclaimed books, including a New York Times bestseller, Case Closed, Why America Slept, and God's Bankers. He also is the author of Big Pharma, which is actually a big book. Um, and um, you've been called by Gary Wills, a superb investigative reporter, and by the New York Times, painstakingly honest journalism. <clears throat> and um, John Martin of ABC News says you're one of the most successful investigators he's ever encountered in 30 years of journalism. So tonight we're gonna to talk about distribution problems and getting the vaccine. And just before I came on, my daughter texted me and said, my vaccine was canceled for Sunday. And then I look, cause I'm going to the same place uh, next Tuesday. And I got an email also that my vaccine was canceled from Mount Sinai because of shortages. And they were called to reschedule. So, um, so we have a problem, Gerald. Um, <clears throat> people can't get vaccines. It's, it, the websites are crashing. And I guess my question is like, so in New York City, they just put the website up Monday. I mean, they've kind of realized that people were gonna schedule vaccines. So what's, what's the, all the problems? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, sort of where do we start, David, right? Uh, the, right. It, it seemed as though for a few months last summer, uh, the, the goal was, you know, Operation Warp Speed, get a vaccine done. Let's get through the clinical trials. And I think that too many people, especially inside the administration, the Trump administration thought that uh, once you got the vaccine, that that was the that was the main part of it. You know, the rest would be easy. All we'd have to do if it was Pfizer or Moderna is put them in a freezer, send them out to the states, and we'd start to put them into arms, and uh, we'd uh, you know get the numbers right. Uh, they expected 20 million inoculations by the end of December. That was the the goal uh, by the end of the year. They have shipped 30 million um, doses of the vaccines and only 11 million have actually got into arms, the, the first doses. Only 500,000 people have gotten the, the two doses. So that's a remarkably low number. Uh, the, and, and it's not just, by the way, it's not just a US problem, it's sort of a worldwide problem. Uh, my favorite comparison uh, right now is, is in Europe, France and Germany, started on the same day on vaccines. One week later, Germany had done 200,000 inoculations. France, which has the record for being now the worst, has did 536. I know you, you think you heard me wrong, but no, it's 536 for the entire week because in their bureaucracy of their medical system, they required a written consent from everybody in nursing homes and care homes who was getting the vaccine. And if a guardian was appointed, they required the written consent from the guardian. They've clearly done away with that now. So, you know, th that's an anomaly, but they're slow everywhere because they've been surprised by leaving it to states here and to individual countries in the EU. Everybody has a different set of rules. They're applying it in different ways and they have not set up yet the mass vaccination programs and, and sort of the, the outlets that need to be done to get everybody into the system and just start putting people out. Um, it's a backlog that's not going to be easy to overcome. We need what, 65, 70% of people to be infected with COVID or to get vaccines to get uh, some type of herd immunity. So that's 240, 250 million Americans. We've had 25 million COVID infections. That means unfortunately that, you know, we're looking at maybe a million doses a day for the next 220 to 230 days, another eight months, we're not doing a million doses now a day. So it, it's, there's a big hurdle in front of us and we aren't even close to it. Well, everyone thought that the general who was always on, in head of the distribution said, as soon as the vaccines are approved, we are ready to go. We are ready to ship them to the states and everyone's gonna have, you know, everyone's gonna have vaccines and that's not happening. Well, well, they did ship them to the states. So here's the interesting thing, 30 million ships. So why are 19 million not used? And this is, this is part of the issue. So, and it depends upon the state. Some states 
have done a little bit better than others. Uh, at the top of the list, West Virginia, North Dakota, South Dakota, Con uh, Connecticut's done a pretty good job. They, they've done just about 6% of their entire population and a good percentage of those in care homes. They've been very quick at distributing it. New York lagging behind. One of the reasons is if you look at the states that have been quick to get the vaccine into arms, they've said the following. We have rules about who we want to give it to first. We want to give it to people in care homes. We want to give it to frontline workers and healthcare workers. Uh, we want to give it to essential workers after that. And then we're going to go to people over 75 or over 65, depending on how the state takes it. But they haven't been hard and fast. They didn't do what Governor Cuomo said, for instance, which was, you know, if you get out of line and you get the vaccine, you're not really eligible for it as the next group. Maybe you could go to jail for that. There might be criminal penalties for that. If you start to scare people from if the vaccine isn't distributed, for instance, on a given day to the care home that was supposed to get it, or there was vaccine left over, for instance, in Ohio, the governor of Ohio declared a couple of weeks ago that up to 60 percent of the health care workers in care homes in Ohio did not want the vaccine initially. They had some concerns about it. Well, they had sent the numbers of vaccine out to give all those care workers the vaccine, but in the end, if they aren't distributing it, what do you do at the end of the day or at the end of two days when it might expire? Instead of letting it go to waste, you put it into arms. And so states that have been good have had a list of people to go to next right away. States that haven't been as good have actually had to dispose of some vaccine and get rid of it, which is disgraceful. Well, I think in New York um, on Monday, they said people 75 and over could qualify. And on Tuesday, they announced <clears throat> that people over 65 and over. So, and that came from the Trump administration, the CDC. So I think that caused some confusion and wet causing websites to crash. And, but I still think we should have had a, a better job and we also lack national, leader, national guidelines. Yeah, no, 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 I agree with you. National guidelines are absolutely critical, but at the same time, let's say the national guideline is now, as you said, the CDC 65 and over. So in Florida, Governor DeSantis had made it 65 and older uh, about a week and a half before that. That's what his level was. He decided that that was, it sounds great. Um, Trisha, my wife, me, we, we qualify and therefore we're part of the four and a half million Floridians who suddenly were flooding their local healthcare institutes and clinics trying to get an appointment for a vaccine. So you have four and a half million people trying to all of a sudden to get online, as you said, or doing telephone calls to get through literally hundreds of calls on auto redial to get to places like Baptist or University of Miami Health or Mount Sinai here in Florida. The, uh, and in the end, we were able to get through at one point to Mount Sinai, which gave us a March 2nd appointment for our first dose. And it seems fairly far off to me, especially, you know, as you've discovered, sometimes uh, appointments can change at the last minute if they run short. So that means to me that the overload here in Florida is so great that even on the group that they're trying to hit first, which is 65 and older, figuring that they are more vulnerable, they have the higher death rates, they have the higher incidence of, of effects from COVID, they end up in the hospital more often. Even then, you're already pushing out two months on those of us who are getting through early. And I know that others aren't even getting through. So this is a problem. There's a debate taking place as well, David, as you know, inside some of the governments, which is what do we do if we do have vaccine to distribute before it expires? Um, do we give it out at the end of the day? Let's say there's, there's a stadium that's uh, here. You have Hard Rock Stadium where people are, uh, make appointments and then they arrive. There are several thousand people. They wait for hours. Sometimes they run behind on the appointments. What happens if at the end of the day, 15, 20, 25 people have not shown up for whatever reason? They had a calamity, some emergency, a car accident. They didn't get there. The vaccine's ready to be given. Do you give it out to people who are first come, first served? And if that becomes the basis, you're going to have people then crowding those sites every day without appointments, hoping they can get in. You need a little bit of security at the same time to keep order to this when you're doing it in a mass public venue. One last thing on this. I, I think what we underestimate, and when I say we, I mean the government in general, and those of us who follow it in terms of, of journalists and authors. And that was that we look back at the polio vaccine, we say, okay, tens of millions of vaccines, but that was over a decade in the 60s to children and then over another 20 years it was given out over a slower period of time. The here, we need to have it done quickly because we have an infectious disease that has a death rate that's moving up. But the problem is we're sending it into a system 
to be given away by healthcare workers who are already stressed to the limit in many times by dealing and treating COVID patients. So you have people who are already exhausted and now you're asking them to be part of the administration of literally tens of millions of vaccines in a very short amount of time. Uh, and the federal government to its, to, you know, its shame, I say, has given very little assistance in terms of the financing, not just the direction, you're right, but the CDC provided $345 million that was given out in intervals. It wasn't until this last stimulus bill that went through at $900 billion plus that Trump signed to Congress had passed that $8 billion is finally set aside for vaccine distribution. Seems a little bit late when you're doing that in January and you really wanted to be giving the shots already by December of the previous year. Okay, so for the audience, if you have a question, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Please um, put your questions in there. I see four people have already asked questions. And, but I would like to, everyone to get a chance to do that. And um, so let's talk about, there's one thing to, to get the vaccine. The other question is how effective is it? And also <clears throat> there are new variants and people are, are asking about that. It, well, you know, so, I mean, everybody has to realize, and I think they do, uh, that we are not talking in, in the case of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or any of the vaccines coming up, which are more traditional ones, adenovirus uh, vaccines like J Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca. We're not talking about sterilizing vaccines here. These are not vaccines like the measles vaccine that are going to do away with COVID and we aren't going to have to worry about it again. They're going to give us some immunity, build up some antibodies, and maybe some T cell resistance to COVID for a certain amount of time. We're just not sure how much time. So we're going to find that out. We're the living experiment for it. You know, in an ideal situation, you as a science writer, me as an author who's looked at the pharmaceutical industry for five years, if you said to me, what's the ideal? I'd say, let's have six months of, cl uh, of clinical uh, stage three trials. Let's see what happens, uh, you know, build up and find out exactly how long that immunity lasts. But we had two months here. So, you know, it had to be pushed out a little bit faster. The testing is clear that both Pfizer and Moderna give a very high level of at least immunity from catching the disease. That doesn't mean that you have immunity from getting infected again or that you have immunity from passing it to someone else which may disappoint a lot of people in the general public who are going to discover they have to take a vaccine and still wear a mask and still do social distancing. Um, but that aside, uh, you know, you will get six, seven, eight months, maybe more of protection from what I call the standard COVID-19 that we started to, to research in the summer of last year. Now, the questions are, you said variants. Great question, uh, the BioNTech, the German partner of Pfizer and Moderna have both said that their vaccines are almost as effective against the UK variant as it is against the general variant that's spread. They're not as confident about the South Africa variant and a new one from Brazil. It will still provide some protection, but we don't know how much protection. So maybe it's not going to be 95% effective as Pfizer says, maybe it'll be 75 or 80% effective against some of those variants. And the, the problem here is, these companies have done their testing in a very specific manner based upon one dose and then a second dose three weeks later with Pfizer and up to five weeks later with Moderna. Now is because of the fact that countries are in a rush to get inoculations into their citizens armed, you have countries like Denmark and the UK and others and, and even some suggestions here in the US that everybody should get one shot, take all those 200 million doses that'll be out from Pfizer and Moderna. Don't worry about the second shot, put them into everybody's arms and you'll get some immunity against, the, against COVID. And then we'll worry about producing enough to get the second shots whenever we can. I personally don't think that's a great idea. What I do think we have to do in the short term, and I hope this is one of the things the Biden administration does, this is sort of the material you never see at the front pages, you never see it in, in a public discussion, but it's the backroom work that makes a difference. And that is the United States is lagging way behind on genomic sequencing of the virus. So there's an international database in which countries go ahead and they take the viruses in a random sampling that they get in their country, then they analyze and then they post the results online for everybody to see and share. That's how we find out about the UK variant. That's how we find out about South Africa. It's what we know in Brazil. And yet, what are we doing in the United States? We've done about 50,000 that genomic sequencing on the, on the virus. We should be at this point, according to experts, at 10 million. 
So we are 61st in the world in terms of doing it. Uh, I, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh are ahead of us on doing genomic sequencing um, for per capita for their countries. That can't be a good sign. And so I'm hoping that the Biden administration will give some money and make some effort to get the laboratories and the universities that are good at doing that, doing that in the US so that we can be ahead of the curve if a strain is coming out here that's mutating or and changing, instead of waiting for it to already be infecting across the population, we might be aware of it and the makers of the vaccines might be able to tinker their products a little bit to catch it before it becomes resistant to the existing vaccines. Okay, so I'm going to read some questions. These were actually sent before the talk. Would you consider the issues with vaccine distribution the same as testing? If the issue with the total number of people that have been that have to be completed or the government's inability to handle any job effectively due to bureaucracy and state to state politics. So basically they're asking, you know, we have problem with testing and now we have problems with vaccine distribution. Yeah, I mean the they're they're related in the sense of yes, inefficiency, bureaucracy, definitely state to state competition and the fact that we've left this to 50 different state rules as opposed to having federal regulations that are much clearer. But in addition, I think that there's something different. In the beginning on the testing, it wasn't just a lack of testing, but there were questions about the test kits themselves. The CDC had done a reorder. There were some fast test kits that proved to be pretty ineffective. There were test kits that were giving false positives and some states were ordering less than they needed of different brands that were competing brands. Here, the marketplace is simple. It's Pfizer or Moderna right now. So you don't even have to worry about a third vaccine. You wanna get as much product as you can in your state. And then the, pro the question is, it would be as if in the testing situation, the, the problem was scarcity. So we had this these two great tests out there and all you had to do was get them into your state and then you fumbled it in giving them out to people. Yes, you'd be to blame for that. Here, you have two vaccines that are effective. If you get the supply into your state, then you're giving it out and you know, here's, there's a statistic that I, I, I wonder how effective it is being done at the state level, because it, even for the few that are doing it well, the number one priority seems to be getting it into uh, the arms of people in care homes, in elderly care homes. That's the highest death rate. A new CDC statistic just out showed that at the end of last year and the beginning of January, the overwhelming number of deaths that took place in, and serious infections were from people in care homes. So we want to take care of that. And, and guess what? We have given out about 1.2 million injections, first shots only, in care homes. There are literally 9 million people still waiting to get them. So how is it possible that in the 11 million doses that have been given out so far, I can't say to you today, 50, 60, 70 percent of all the care homes around the United States have received at least one inoculation. And, and care homes, think about this, we know where they are. Meaning that if you're a state health board, if you're a community, if you're a community health service, a, mm -hmm. a clinician, a provider, you don't have to go and look for them. You don't have to look for people with comorbidity or people who are obese or people who are over 65 and check their ID. The care homes, they are in there. And so, you know, this would be a place that you would think you would be able to get to fairly quickly, go down the line of doing it. And for whatever reason, it's not happening. Okay, so another question. Has the federal government announced that it will release this to the states all available doses of the COVID vaccine? I heard that's what that's what Biden wants to do. And if so, that means they're going to worry about manufacturing it later and worry about give, not giving it within the treatment regimen? You know, uh, President-elect Biden has a pretty good team around him on COVID. And right. I know yeah. that they have made the decision to release all the vaccine stock the, uh, at once. And people have interpreted that to mean that he is in favor of the Boris Johnson UK approach of one shot now, um, and then we'll worry about getting the, the manufacturing up for the additional doses down the road. I'm not sure until I hear that as policy that that's the case. I still think that's a mistake because, you know, unintended consequences, the best intentions are to get it into everybody's arm as fast as possible. But then what if the manufacturing isn't up to par? The manufacturing on vaccines isn't the easiest thing in the world. You know, I don't want people to think that you go ahead and you manufacture vaccines. It's like turning out, uh, you know, um, a, a keyboard and that you're turning out 100,000 every week and that's the end of it. And so there, there's a few that are bad. Manufacturing vaccines, the process itself 
It's like making 10,000 pies in a, in a bakery. There are going to be a few that are bad. So some of those always fall off. There's always a small fall off in the manufacturing process. Then there's a testing for consistency and purity process. You know, they're made in different facilities. So they have to make sure the vaccines going out are precisely the same. They test for that. And there's always a little bit of difference and some then is discarded. Then they are, have supply chain constraints about the bottles, the buffers, the, the tips, the dry ice, everything else that has to go out with it. And then you have some vaccines that once they get out in the field, they're held too long, uh, the vials break, there's a loss of one to 2%. So even when manufacturers tell you they can produce 100 million doses or 150 million doses, there's some slippage from that. And David, the key is, I think everybody has to remember, this is one of the things I came across when I was researching pharma and I've looked at it now and I'm still amazed at it. The drug companies, the, the uh, Pfizer and BioNTech in this case, and Moderna, and there will soon be J and J and AstraZeneca, do not disclose what their manufacturing capacity is. They tell you what they can produce, but we don't know what their total number is. They hold that close to the vest, even in medical emergencies, at times of AIDS, when AIDS was raging in therapeutics, they never give you that because that's held close to the vest because of two things, is part of the negotiation for them. But in addition, they have other drugs in their drug line they don't want to have to start stop the processes for every cholesterol drug and every heart medication, every cancer treatment, and suddenly turn everything into just vaccine production. They would think that was punishing them. So they don't. We don't actually know how much they could produce. We know what they say they're producing, and then there's some shortage from that. So I'm hoping the Biden administration does not say one shot now. Let's hope it's 50 percent effective or more, and that'll carry until we can get you a second shot in up to three months. That's what they're doing in the UK. I think that's a great gamble. It may turn out to be all right, but it's a gamble. Well, I asked Paul Offit, who's been a guest uh, like you twice, and he said he is against um, deviating from the protocol. Well, it, it, isn't it amazing that deviating from the protocol is it hasn't been tested. So you're taking a gamble. You have people who are not the clinicians, who aren't those who have been giving the test saying, we think maybe it's better this way. It's based strictly on a cold calculus that we can get enough of. And, and some of the health officials, for instance, in the UK have miscited the Pfizer data. They say, oh, by the way, Pfizer shows that 12 days after the first shot, you have a 90% effectiveness. That's in a few cases and it starts to fade off very, very fast. That's why you need the second dose to get the full 95%. The, uh, there are some uh, epidemiologists that think eventually you might be able to give a half dose twice, and that could be fairly effective. And there is some thinking that if you had COVID already, one dose might be enough to reactivate your immune system so you have full protection. But again, that all has to be tested in clinical trials. So here's a question. What's the realistic probability of scaling up manufacturing? New York City was into April for appointments at the Javits Center early yesterday. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, th that's, so the answer to that is, it's not going to happen nearly as fast as we need because, and when I say need, I don't mean just for preventing additional deaths on COVID, but returning to some sense of, uh, of what would be quasi normal behavior um, when the disease starts to uh, no longer be so actively spreading itself. Those numbers are toward the end of the year. I mean, here in the United States, before we see the numbers infected and inoculated, where we can safely say the disease is probably starting to be pushed back and no longer spreading as widely. Looking at the end of the year, that's, that's a long ways off. And I'll tell you that, you know, talk to WHO officials. I do talk to some of the WHO officials regularly. They're looking at 10 to 12 billion doses of vaccine twice, assuming you have to do two to get five to six billion people inoculated out of the eight billion on the planet. And they don't think they're gonna finish the 2024 on doing that. So, you know, further out for countries that don't have the ability to buy the vaccines like we do and in, in, in Europe. Well, maybe the vaccines, maybe the COVID, COVID will just magically disappear. <laughs> well, you, they, look at, you know, you laugh, but we know that happens sometimes, uh, yeah, as strange as that may be. Uh, yeah. I talk to friends and I talk to them about, you know, H1N1 and others that times you get a, a, a virus out and it mutates. And guess what? You know, viruses are pretty smart. They're living organisms. I get it. They need us to survive. We're the host. And they do continue to mutate generally in a way that makes them a little bit more virulent occasionally or a little bit easier to, to be infectious. But occasionally they mutate in a way that 
works against their own advantage. It makes them a weaker structure, easier for them. And, and so you do see viruses that peter out because the mutation works in nature's way against them. That would be very, very nice. Uh, New York Times had a very good piece the other day. I think you'll be interviewing that reporter in a couple of weeks, but they, uh, and that was that maybe over time, and time means in this case, a few years to a few decades, and it's hard to imagine, we will see coronavirus is not going away, will be here, it will be on the planet, but it may be no different than just the common cold. Remember, you know, the six other coronaviruses, four are, are the equivalent of common colds, one's SARS and one's MERS, and although they are pretty deadly, they aren't as infectious, so COVID is unusual in that sense, quite infectious, not quite as deadly, but still deadly enough to be a very dangerous pandemic. What will it become eventually? It might become like the common cold, it might become like the seasonal flu, you might get spikes of COVID 10 years from now, even on the flu, many people will remember in 1967, the then called the so-called Hong Kong flu, a virulent flu that hit, you'll get years that are much worse and people may have to then rechange the vaccine or take booster shots along the way. So here's a pretty grueling, um, it seems a lack of funding that's causing a lot of, <clears throat> causes the backlog. There are not enough people to check in, check people in to get the vaccine. My friend is a nurse, at a 9 a.m. appointment, when she got there, the line was already very long. People were not social distancing, and they were waiting in a hall with poor circulation. She left because she thought she may get COVID waiting in line. I don't see this getting better until there is more funding for the states. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, funding's critical, but you know, it's going to take more than just throwing money at it because if we throw a lot of money at it without better organization, this is a shame the federal government didn't take the lead on this. You're going to get some states that are stellar okay. and some that are still going to lag behind. We still need people to, to do the injections. So, you know, it would be fantastic if this happened to be um, uh, like a sugar cube as the one of the polio vaccines had been and it could be dispensed by just about anybody. But in this case, we need uh, nurses. We could take people from the army and from the, uh, we could get people from all of the armed forces who are medics. We could get the medic crew and those trained to be able to give out vaccines at large public sites like stadiums. That might be fantastic. Uh, the same thing could be the National Guard. We aren't doing that yet. So it would require the personnel to do that as well as the organization. And I think there's another thing about the money. It's not just a matter of getting the vaccines done, but we need, I think, easy for me to say sitting here without any authority at all. Um, and I certainly don't have the Biden administrations here, but I hope that they spend some money on public service announcements to get people to take vaccines because there are those of us who are ready to take vaccines and then those who absolutely are against it. And that's gonna be part of the problem. If we need 60 to 70% of the country vaccinated, even if you're doing it in perfect order and in great numbers and everything else, you go back to the Ohio governor who says 60% of his care workers in, in care homes, the workers did not wanna take it because of concerns over it. In France, which had the 516 or 536 vaccines in the first week, they also have one of the highest uh, sort of vaccine skeptic polls in all of Europe. Only 40% of the French public in public opinion polls believe that the vaccine is the answer and are looking forward to taking it. If you don't change that type of public opinion, you're in trouble. And I don't see any effective PSEs that are running that really champion the benefits of the vaccine and how it can return normal life for this country and for many countries very, very quickly. That's where some of the money should be spent, I believe. So there was an article and Anthony Fauci speaks about this, how New York City vaccinated 6 million people in less than a month. That was in 1947 when there was smallpox. Why can't we do that? <laughs> yeah, that's, it's a, it is a great question. And we did in fact use in 1947. So not only was the civilian base was used, but we did use some of the, you know, coming out of the war, we had that excess base of so where people still on service duty and that. Uh, the, the centers were set up and it was an amazing job that was done. There were two things that stand out about that. And I've looked back at that. The organization was there. And so they were able to, to do it in a way in which it rolled out smoothly. There was no panic built in. Uh, they had the numbers. They didn't do it. They had to do so many a day, but they didn't do it in terms of age groups or whatever else. So they didn't have the categories. And, you know, maybe that eventually is going to happen here in larger groups. And they also had the numbers for the administration of it. Um, and, and we just, I think part of the difficulty here is, look at 1947, the smallpox vaccine, or in terms of those vaccinations. You were not coming into a healthcare system in New York 
that was already stretched to its limits where people had been working for nearly a year on their hospitals being filled with smallpox cases, with people going into emergency rooms, with people dying without having the break. So part of our difficulty here is that we're coming into a system that's already stretched in many ways for the individuals who are at the front lines who would be administering this and the clinics and the hospitals and the clinicians that are already at their exhaustion point. That makes it, that's another hurdle. There's no cure for that. I'm not saying there's an easy fix, money won't do it. And you can't train people overnight to do it. But I think we have to recognize that that's an additional difficulty here. And we haven't yet figured out how to add to the already enormous load of responsibility, work and stress that the frontline healthcare workers have had for nearly the past, you know, nine, 11 months, 10 months, now add on to them the responsibility of also dispensing the tens of millions of vaccines needed. That's a tough one. Okay, so in light of recent violence, is there any thought of protecting vaccination sites? Mm. The, we had uh, one doctor I think did not believe um, in vaccines and exposed some of the vaccine, lost a hundred and some odd doses. You know, that was a case in sort of an anti-vaxxer made it, mm. an attack on it. We haven't had, uh, originally Pfizer was um, having some armed um, escorts for some of its large vaccine shipments initially because they were afraid that they could be subject not to being stolen and being given away or sold on the web or on eBay, but they were worried about sabotage. They were worried about a terrorist organization possibly coming in and, um, and trying to make an attack on it, doing a 9-11 attack, but on the vaccine load for 100 million doses would be lost. If a manufacturing plant that was producing the bulk of the Pfizer vaccine was attacked and bombed uh, tomorrow and went offline, there would be a panic over the vaccine supply line that would be far beyond just the attack. So I think there was concern about that in terms of criminal attacks. And there's always the possibility of militant anti-vaxxers who think that the government is about to at any moment force them to require them and mandate them to have a vaccine and they won't be able to take a plane flight because the FAA is gonna require a vaccine card and things like this who are so concerned that you know, there has been no violence yet, but I think, you know, you always have to have it in the back of your mind. One of my guests said that uh, he was wondering if uh, Tony Soprano and his gang are going to uh, <coughs> steal a shipment that comes in from Newark. Uh, which, See, which is, uh, I think that uh, Tony Soprano <coughs> and his gang would have a doctor already on their payroll who will give them vaccines, whether they are 65 or not. Okay. What can be done to ensure those over 75, the highest risk group, get it between, get it, I'm sorry. What can be done to ensure that people over 65 get it before those between 65 and 75? When Cuomo opened it up to 65 and over, they were able to work the system better and get appointments, leaving the elderly out. Um, well, I did get an appointment, but they canceled it. So just, <laughs> just so you know that. Also, many of those over 75 do, don't have computers or have difficulties navigating the system. It's totally unfair, and I kind of agree. Uh, no, no, there's no question about that. As a matter of fact, we've reached out to uh, people that we know here in Miami Beach with a concern over that. So for instance, there's a uh, person who lives on his own. His wife died a year ago. He's a community activist, Morris Sunshine. Um, he's 96 years old, and uh, he was having trouble getting, a doctor told him it was time to call in. He was calling constantly. He has a computer. He's able to go on a mm -hmm. computer in his case, but he was not able to get through. Now, if he can't get an appointment in 96, the, uh, then I shouldn't be taking it. Somebody else at 65 who's healthy, you know, relatively healthy, doesn't have comorbidity, should be taking that place ahead just because you're more persistent on making the calls on auto re redial or logging in early in the morning onto the computer system to get an appointment. I do think that's a, a problem. When they opened up the categories at the CDC or here in Florida before that at 65 and above, I worry about those at greater risk, those over 85, those over 75. So in the UK, for instance, um, Trisha's cousin, her husband is in his 80s. He received the first vaccine very, very early in their area in Hertfordshire. He was supposed to get in the Pfizer vaccine, the second shot three weeks later, the day before he was to go back for his second shot, they canceled it on him and said, by the way, we'll be contacting you in another two and a half months because we've now rolled it out to three months. So. You know, is it the best? No, but those in their 80s should definitely be ahead of those in their 70s. But how do you do that? You can't, as a practical matter, once you've opened up the gates to 65 and above, somebody shows up for their appointment, they produce their license, they're 66 years old, you can't say no to them. 
uh, even if somebody who's 90 can't get through. And that's, that's a failure of the system. I kind of agree. Um, so someone asked, do you think people who have already had COVID should wait until the people who never had COVID get back COVID? Well, in an ideal selfless world, that would be fantastic. Uh, we know that getting COVID you know, gives you some natural immunity. And a matter of fact, there are a number of you talk to epidemiologists, they believe it gives you probably a better immunity than what the vaccine might give you. Your body has learned how to fight off and ward off mm -hmm. the disease naturally is pretty good. We don't know how long that effectiveness will last for. So there is no doubt that people who have had COVID will eventually need a vaccine. There is, as we talked about before, some discussion as to whether you might be able to get by with one dose of the vaccine and then have full effectiveness again, because you've already had the natural underlying. But it would be fantastic if you were able to say to those people, you've been infected, if it wasn't March or April of last year and might be wearing off already, you've had it recently, you should go to the end of the line, even if you're over 65, because those who have never had it are the ones most at risk. So someone asked, um, clearly the vaccine raw was mishandled. What does Mr. Posner think? What do you, what do you think the approach should have been and still could be potentially? Well, I mean, you know, the, I look often, and I, I was sort of a voracious reader anyway, but especially on this issue of vaccines, and I keep looking at articles about, okay, here's the problem. Well, how could we have done it better? And I must tell you that even when I read about the best states, and we talked about them before, Connecticut, you know, West Virginia, places like a small patient populations, there isn't any magic in there. So it's not as though one of them has come up with a solution where I can say, okay, Monday morning quarterbacking, this is what we should have done from the start we would have been ahead of the game. The one thing I know is absolutely wrong is to have such rigid rules about what groups qualify to first get the vaccine, that if those groups aren't getting it right away, that you aren't going on to other groups. If you hold those rules too steadfast, then you're not distributing it throughout the population as fast as you can. You've got to have a little bit of sort of what I call, you know, uh, ability to, to be moving on those constantly. So you wanna hit people 75 and up, great. You wanna hit people 65 and up in care homes and first line healthcare workers. But if you have vaccine that's not being distributed, that's about to expire because it's past its seven days, out, uh, past that freezer point as the Pfizer vaccine, and you're gonna lose 400 or 500 doses, get people at the hospital, get people locally, put it into somebody's arm, no matter what, even if a 35 year old walks out that day with a vaccine, which is some, what some states have figured out to do, don't waste any. If we're throwing vaccine away, that's a shot that could have gone to somebody, even if they didn't fit into one of the high risk groups, we should be distributing it. So I know AstraZeneca is gonna come out at some point. Um, I think they're talking about March, Johnson & Johnson announced some data today, which is good, but they said they'll have more data in January <clears throat> and they're looking at March also. And they're also one shot, which is I think a great advantage. No question about it. Uh, you know, and it, it, the, the one shots and they also aren't messenger RNA. There may be a few, maybe, maybe we'll have to see a slightly lower transient side effect profile in terms of fevers or that. So it may be easier shots to take. Um, and the one shot will be a big advantage. Now, the Johnson Johnson information looks great, 70% effectiveness after one shot, but we don't know how long that lasts. And it's based upon a, a stage two clinical trial of 805 people. So the big trial with 40,000 people, stage three, we're waiting for that. Let's see if those numbers hold up. AstraZeneca's had this problem, as you know, they did one entire study, their biggest one, with the wrong dosage, and that's why they've been delayed here. So those, those vaccines have been slower than expected, but if they do come out, and let's say it's 65 to 70% effectiveness with one shot and they are cheap. We don't know J&J's pricing yet, but AstraZeneca is three to $4 a dose versus $19 on average, let's say with Pfizer. Governments, especially in the developing world are going to use AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson nonstop. And I think even in Europe and the US, you will see it as a shot that many will go to. In addition to its one shot benefit, one thing that we know it also has is it doesn't need to be stored in a freezer. It doesn't need to be kept at minus 94 degrees as the Pfizer vaccine or in a refrigerator as Moderna does. Easier to transport. You don't have to worry about it expiring at the same time. Those are major advantages as well. The problem for us in the United States and in Europe and the rest of the world was that the first vaccines that got approved that went over the finish line that were successful 
were the two most difficult vaccines to distribute, the two most difficult vaccines in terms of a short shelf life. That's not to say anything against them. They just are the tougher ones in terms of administering. They're two shot vaccines in addition. And when did they get approved? They got approved in a cycle that meant we started to ship vaccines in December, right at the time when in the United States, we were relying on airlines, okay? They're using, they had nothing else to do. They aren't carrying many passengers, but FedEx and UPS are maxed out on their holiday shipments. And we're asking them also to carry millions of doses of vaccine. So the timing is bad all the way around. Hospitals that are supposed to be administering the vaccine are also in seeing increasing numbers of cases of COVID coming in because it's winter time. So it's, it was just the perfect storm. The most difficult vaccines in terms of storage and distribution and maneuvering and, and are the ones that are approved first right into the heart of winter. So um, come spring, you're right. You get these other two vaccines in, they're easier to distribute, they're cheaper. They have pretty good effectiveness, a low profile on um, side effects. And um, I think you're gonna see them used widely. Okay. Um... So my cousins in Israel said, you, everyone has to belong, to belong to an HMO. And they all got a text message and saying, you know, so they have electronic medical, medical records. They all got a text message. This is when your vaccine is. So everyone I know has gotten the first, they've done all the people in their 60s and 70s. Now they're going down to people in 50s and they said they're gonna vaccinate everybody by March. Now I know it's a smaller country, but I would love to be a, get a text message and say, this is your date to get it. That's not happening here. That's right. I, if I got a text message that said, this is your date to get a vaccine, I would think somebody had hacked my phone because I know that it would be so incredible for that advancement to take place, something would be wrong. But you're right, that, that's the ideal situation. Look, at when we say that Israel has been successful, measure the numbers. I looked at the statistics to measure it. Before, I was touting the effectiveness of West Virginia, North Dakota and South Dakota, small population states, relatively small, at 6% of the population has been so far one inoculation. Israel is approaching 20%. That's remarkable, the entire country. So you're right, it works. Uh, the, the access to the medical records, the fact that everybody's on file, the fact that they get those messages, they organize it, they had it set. You could do it in a state without any doubt. You don't have the access to the electronic uh, you know, uh, medical records as easily. They haven't been done in most states, but uh, that's unfortunate. But Israel is the beacon of how it could be done in the future. Uh, I just don't know if uh, anybody's gonna spend the, uh, the money to get there. They're hoping this is the last time in their lifetime as politicians, they will ever have to deal with a vaccine rollout like this. Okay. So very little has been said about the distribution once we get past the first couple of groups. Will it, be, will it be a big open call for the rest of us? Or, or will there be other factors they go by such as age or the greater population density? I, uh, the, you know, I initially, when I was talking to the original epidemiologist I spoke to like two or three months ago said, oh, we should go by groups. So we should even have, if you have comorbidity um, and you have diabetes and you have high blood pressure, maybe you should go ahead of somebody if you're 35 with those two conditions, maybe you should go ahead of somebody who's 65 and doesn't have any conditions at all that are noticeable. So age mm -hmm. shouldn't be the controlling factor. Now, those very same people are telling me that's impossible to do. You, it, it, if you have a reservation made, let's say for a vaccine and the person has said that they are from out of state, you may not have access to their medical records. You have to give it to people who are from out of state or are traveling or are there. They may say they have those comorbid factors. How do you confirm that? Uh, it happens that they show up that day and they don't have it. So the difficulty of how that could slow up the system in West Virginia, for instance, it has one of the highest obesity rates in the country. I don't mean to insult any of my West Virginian friends, but it just does. The governor there decided that obesity together with all of the, the side effects that it has in, in high blood pressure and, uh, and diabetes, already onset diabetes, would not be factors that would jump you ahead of the line uh, for those who were 65 and above. So 65 and above was the line. Comorbidity for younger people wasn't a factor. And when he intends to open it up to a wider group under 65, is sort of a first come first serve. They intend to have mobile units go out to those who are underserved. In terms of communities where they don't believe they have access, um, uh, underprivileged communities, underserved poor communities, where they may not have access to computers, the ability to get on and make those appointments. They'll have mobile units for that. The same thing sometimes uh, possibly with, with prisons may be taking place. 
and sometimes with schools, but for the most part, it's gonna be first come first served. You get through the door for 18 and above because the vaccine hasn't been approved for under that at this time. And uh, they won't be uh, looking for the comorbidity factors because I don't think they would be able to without slowing the process up so much, it would be crippling. So I wanna ask a few questions that, uh, about, um, so the denovirus-based vaccines, are there any medical reasons for someone to be given one of those rather than the mRNA-based ones besides being allergic? Aside from being allergic, and mm -hmm. there, you know, the, there have been some allergic reactions, serious ones, uh, anaphylaxis has uh, you know, over a dozen cases so far, but we have to find out if that's from the vaccine or not, but clearly it's one of the issues of concern. mRNA vaccines have long, although these are the first who ever approved, the idea, the concept of them has long been concern over autoimmune diseases. Do they provoke an inflammatory response because they're making the body, you know, provoke this response to the spike cell in the coronavirus? It, could it cause a problem for people with lupus or people with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune diseases, HIV? The study so far, the testing says, no, you're fine. You have an autoimmune disease. You can go ahead and get it. You're being treated for cancer. You can go ahead and get it. There's no question that the, the non-mRNA vaccines, what I call the more traditional one, the adenovirus, as you said, what we're used to on flu vaccines and injections, those, tend, those would have even less of a side effect risk for people with autoimmune diseases if that was at all a concern. The, um, but that would be the only possibility for the mRNA. And I raise that as a theoretical possibility, the, but nothing that has been proven. You know, So I see the headlines as well. Tricia, who's British, will open up the Daily Mail and there's a banner headline that says, doctor in Florida dies two weeks after taking you know, Pfizer vaccine. Um, and another 100,000 people around the country probably just decided not to take the Pfizer vaccine as a result without any idea as to whether that's connected to the vaccine or he would have died anyway from the heart attack or whatever else he had. No connection's been made to the vaccine in that study and that'll be looked at. So you know that, that's how things happen. But I think that it's one, it goes back to David, what we were talking about before. It's one of the reasons for PSEs are needed. If we're not doing PSEs from the government level and getting the word out there about why vaccines are used, mm -hmm. every time a tabloid or a newspaper carries a story about somebody who has lost a week at work or run 104 fever or died two or three weeks after taking a vaccine and ties it to that, you're gonna have more people reluctant to take it and that's gonna hurt the overall effect to get herd immunity. We're not going to, we're not going to get out of this pandemic by containment. That's clear. We're past that point. So we're going to have to get it out through natural immunity and vaccinations. When someone told me that and said, why are you getting the vaccine? I said, well, people who have hot dogs, they sometimes die the day after they had a hot dog. Are we going to ban hot dogs? You know, you don't know. So, yeah. Um, the, uh, and, and that's why, by the way, we all like to have a longer testing period. So. It, it, Guillain Barre, which you know was a neurological syndrome that came out after they gave 40 million doses of the swine flu vaccine in 1976. How do they determine that? Because as you just said, they know that there's a certain number of people in a population set of 200, 250, 300 million people that are going to develop that neurological condition in any case. They know what that number is. Now they look at the number of people who got the vaccine and they see the increase. It's the same way you measure mortality some way in these cases. And they know whether it's vaccine related somehow. They may not know every instance, but they'll see the spike and they can tie it in that into that form. So I think, you know, it's the way science works. It's the way that statisticians work with science. The public expects there to be a direct causal link to every shot given. It should be so simple. The only thing we know for sure is when you get the vaccine, if you experience a fever, which a few percent do, uh, you have achiness in your arm, you've got headaches, your muscles ache, things like that. Yeah, you can be pretty sure that's probably from the vaccine. You might've had the bad luck of getting a cold at the same time, but it's likely the vaccine. Those are transient effects. What people are concerned about are longer term effects, more deadly effects, the, that something strange is gonna happen. I've even seen on the internet, <laughs> everything's on the internet, so why shouldn't I see this? That th there are people who believe that mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna change your DNA. Somehow they're confused with the idea of RNA and DNA. They think that it alters the DNA inside of people, that it will be used for tracking people in the future, that it may cause genetic changes that nobody will know what will happen down the road. So there are these science fiction theories built up around it as well, all of them not to the, the benefit of getting the vaccine. 
in that Bill Gates wants to, it's, it's Bill Gates who wants to track everybody in the world. Yeah, um, and, and track everybody at the same time he's sterilizing uh, half the population. So right. I don't know about this. One leading theory about the more infectious variant of the virus in Great Britain is that it was shed by a person who had a long active case of COVID-19, some 12 weeks. The idea is the man's immune, immune system challenged the virus long enough to enable the variant to evolve. Hence my question, if we delay the second doses of the vaccine or not give it at all, do we risk creating variants? Absolutely. The, mm -hmm. You just raised, for me, one of the most concerning issues, and that is this discussion of, okay, how much how much protection, how much immunity are we going to give to somebody with just one dose and then we're going to wait? Well, what we're doing is something we're playing with science in a different way because if you give that one dose and you haven't given the full effectiveness of what a two dose uh, vaccine is meant to be by the, the clinical trials, you haven't given the full protection, you allow coronavirus to probably infect a person who has it. And then it starts to build up because it's not being kept at abeyance in the full way. It can start to build up some resistance to the existing treatment, to the existing vaccine. We can essentially create variants on steroids to a bit, the same way that bacteria bacterial infections eventually become resistant to the overuse of antibiotics. In this case, you'd have COVID starting to get resistant to a half dose of the vaccine, and that would be very dangerous. In addition, you know, David, the, the, while they're trying to pinpoint the actual start of it, one of the things interesting about the variant in the UK and the same in South Africa, I don't know if, I can't say this about the Brazilian because I haven't seen this yet in a, in a study or paper, and that is that you, the individuals who have it have a greater, much greater viral load in their throat and in their nasal passages. So one of the theories is that it's more infectious, up to 70%, 50%, you know, the, the, the stats vary. Mm -hmm. It's more infectious because when people are doing normal things like talking, um, yelling, whatever, they're indoors, they're passing along more of the virus than they were before our old six feet stand away. In Britain recently, that was increased to nine feet, by the way, and they've done lockdown because they believe that individuals with the new variant have that variant in big loads right here at the point where they're giving it out. And that's one of the reasons it makes sense that it might be something that is spreading just not because it's more infectious as COVID itself, it's in a form that is more infectious. And look at the history of viruses is filled with this and, and, and with bacteria as well. You know, they're, they're smart enough in their own way to figure out ways to survive, spread and become ever easier to pass along. So COVID might be doing that in this, in this variant. So do you know that if a person is vaccinated and tests negative for the illness, can they still spread the illness? Or we don't, we don't know for sure. We don't know, and that's the great, you know, uh, the, mm -hmm. one of the things, uh, you know, in, uh, in my book, Pharma, I talked about the, uh, the the concern that they had originally when they were doing vaccines. It turned out to be different with measles. Measles is sort of gives you sterilizing immunity, but they were worried about that. They weren't sure. In the beginning of the uh, measles, so when they were doing vaccines, one of the big concerns was, all right, we give it to you. You're not developing measles yourself, but might you be able to be infected and actually pass it to someone else? So therefore you could still be a super spreader after having received the measles vaccine. Now it turns out that's not the case. That is a sterilizing vaccine, meaning that it stops the, the disease in its track and stops people from passing it on to others and infecting others. It's almost certain that that's not the case with these vaccines. We don't know how much that is the case. So we still yet have to find out, you get a vaccine, you test negative, and yet you're still capable of passing along COVID to somebody else because either the test wasn't right or you're holding it at a level where you haven't triggered the test for a positive result, but you're holding it at a level high enough to still pass to somebody else. And you know we're, we're gonna know that only on Monday morning, meaning after the fact, we'll know then what we should have done. Um, and hopefully there, that won't be as, as big a form of transmission as uh, some fear it could be. So someone wants to know, how did Germany get 200,000 people vaccinated in the first day? What did they get right and what are the lessons for us? And, okay, how, so many did, uh, and how many did they do the second day? Yeah, my understanding is that was, and I may be wrong on this, I have known occasionally to be wrong, so I stand to be corrected, but I thought it was 200,000 the first week, and that's compared to France's 516 in that week. They had 200,000 the first week, and that's to basically care homes they were going to, and they were very organized in terms of how to do it. And they went ahead and they did, by the way, they did give out, I believe, 
98 or 97 percent of the vaccine that they had for that first week they actually distributed they put into people's arms remarkably high number one of the things in europe is the e okay the countries in europe have adopted their own rules as to how they will do the vaccine uh, and that's like the united states so each country is like a, a one of the states but the eu bought the vaccines as a group through brussels so they did the negotiating as a group and brussels decided not to pay as much money for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, gambling that the AstraZeneca would be ready at the same time. And they bought a lot of the AstraZeneca. Now that's been approved in Britain, but hasn't been rolled out yet in the EU. So as a result, there's less vaccine to go around in the EU from Pfizer and from uh, Moderna than there would have been if they had been a little bit bigger with the purse strings, a little bit looser. In addition, remember that BioNTech, which is the technological partner who owns the patents and did all the work on the mRNA for Pfizer, they're German based. There was a bit of national pride in here and they worked with the Merkel government to make sure that the vaccine was being distributed all those places for elderly and care homes as it needed to be. It's one of the reasons I believe they had a good record that week. Pfizer is located on 42nd Street in New York City. <laughs> they should be helping New York City more. I think. <laughs> Yeah, they, should, they should open up and give it to everybody. Um, yeah, well, you know, it, it, it a, you pose a question there that has no answer. It's one of those things, you know, how many angels can fit on the head of a pen? You could have an esoteric discussion about this, but it goes back to what we were talking about before, which is that none of these drug companies will disclose publicly what their production capacity is. So mm -hmm. the question is, what if the United States government said to Pfizer, an American company, we want to know exactly what your capacity is, not what you're producing, not what you're scheduled to produce 200 million doses. What could you produce if you put every one of your production lines onto this vaccine alone? Pfizer comes back with an audit and says, by the way, we could produce twice as many as we have, but it means all the rest of our drug line, which we make a profit on and we're a public company, we would have to put those in abeyance. And some of those are, are drugs for ongoing and serious chronic diseases. So essentially, if you did that as the government, you'd be punishing the pharma companies that discovered the vaccines. They'd be the ones at the forefront who came up with the vaccines and you force them to use all their capacity to manufacture just vaccines. There's no doubt we could end the pandemic a little bit faster if the companies were producing at their maximum, but we would be asking them to essentially then abrogate and give up their entire product line. It's not so easy. We're not just talking about things that are, you know, are to take away psoriasis or itching of that. We're talking about in some cases, cancer treatments and, and heart disease and you know, all, you know, a whole series of things that could be life-threatening if not taken. So there's a fine balance here um, of uh, how much can be distributed, but it's maddening for people to think the companies are also producing other drugs and not giving their entire processing up just to vaccines. So let's end. Um, are you happy? Um, are you optimistic about this? I mean, you do. I mean, you have, you have a vaccine scheduled for March, uh, which is not that soon. No. So you know, I mean, so what happens is if you know enough about this world, you, then you realize that by the way, the effectiveness is in for ten to fourteen days after the each dose. So you get the first dose, your best effectiveness. You're not going to really have it for a week to ten days, and then. Um, if you get the second dose three weeks to a month later, depending on when it is, sometime in April, you're not going to have that for a couple of weeks. So now you're getting near May. By then, where will we be with COVID infections? I have no idea. The, uh, the only good news, if I'm looking at the glass half full view, I said to Tricia, well, the later you get the vaccine, the longer the immunity will last. We'll be having the immunity through all of 2021. All those fast people got it in January. I'll need a shot right away by the time next January comes around. And I think that's one of the things, you know, people hope many lay people think one vaccine and i mean one vaccine meaning two doses with these and one dose maybe with j and j or astrazeneca and that's it but not likely to happen you talked about the variants the you know as it changes a little bit we're going to live with covid i'd be surprised if you don't need a booster shot you know we'll call it a different vaccine but some type of booster um against different variants or that a year down the road um and uh it could be a steady stream, a revenue stream for companies that develop these because they're not going to go away. Uh, all of the companies that get successful vaccines to market, there will be a market for them for some time. Okay, so I just want to plug uh, my organization a little bit. So on Wednesday, January 27th, I'm going to be speaking to John Cohn, who's a staff writer at Science Magazine. Um, 
And next week, I'm going to be speaking January 21st to Dr. John Moore, who is a vaccine expert, and he's going to explain vaccines and why they work. And he, he said they were basically pretty easy to figure out. He said that uh, we had the, we, we knew messenger mRNA, mRNA was not discovered yesterday. So he's from Weill Cornell and uh, he was involved in the HIV AIDS and he's also involved now. On Wednesday, February 3rd, we're gonna to speak to an infectious disease specialist at Weill Cornell, Dr. Morella Salvatore, who treats patients, which uh, we haven't talked to anyone who's actually treating patients. And then on Thursday, February 11th, we're gonna have a conversation with Purva Mandavilli. Um, she's a science and global health reporter at the New York Times, and she has a cover story, I think, almost every day on this. So she's uh, really great. So I want to thank you for, I know I didn't get to everyone, every question, but I want to thank you for spending your second hour with us. And I'm sure we'll see you again soon. So everyone out there, stay safe. Um, you know, I always, you know, kind of just say you should remember all the people Worldwide, there are 93 million cases. It's 1.99 million deaths. The United States has the most cases and the most deaths of any country, and it's India and Brazil. So I just want to take a second to just say, we're talking, in, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, vaccines and people, but a lot of people have died during this time. And I'm hoping that this will be the answer. So again, thank you again. And this will be on our YouTube channel for anyone who missed part of it or wants to see it again. And um, Gerald, thank you very much for taking the time to spend with us. Thanks, uh, David. Thanks for doing a deep dive on uh, vaccine distribution. And uh, let's hope the next time we talk, uh, that part of the process is running as smooth as, uh, as possible. Okay, take care. All right, thanks. You Stay too. safe, everybody.